finally, we'll hear from Hilary Bayer. Hilary Bayer is an ecologist with MAGIC, a Palo Alto-based public service organization. For more than 16 years, she accepted growing responsibility for planting for the second hundred years, which is a MAGIC project to regenerate oak populations on Stanford University lands. In recent years, she's presented on the project in an article for the Pacific Horticulture at the International Oak Soci Society's Triennial Conference at UC Davis in a Stanford University biology course about climate change ecology in diverse oaks for landscape resilience, a report commissioned by Stanford University, land buildings and real estate, and in various other community and professional audiences. So with for this opportunity to share the lessons of Magic's 40 years working with oaks. And thanks to all of you for caring about oaks enough to want to assist them in, the growing, in growing on lands that you steward. Today, I'll briefly summarize Magic's Planting for the Second Hundred Years project at Stanford University and offer recommendations based on that experience. I'm aiming to provide you three benefits. The first is hands-on recommendations that you can apply to plant and protect oaks on your land. The second is perspective on how global trends are increasingly limiting what we can accomplish locally. And the third is a framework and strategy my colleagues and I have found useful for addressing these larger issues. Nearly 50 years ago, ecologists at MAGIC observed that on thousands of acres of Stanford University's rural lands adjacent to central campus, California oak populations were failing to regenerate. Oaks decline posed a threat to the visual character of the landscape and more importantly, to ecosystem integrity. Oaks are a keystone species worldwide, a primary conduit for the energy of sunlight into the biosphere in tropical and temperate ecosystems on five continents. Oak woodlands hold much of California's biodiversity, home to at least 100 mammal, 170 bird, 60 amphibian or reptile, 4,000 insect, 2,000 plant, hundreds, perhaps thousands of fungal and countless microbial species. Wanting oaks to remain without permission or guidance, we started planting acorns. Emulating the man who planted trees and imagining majestic giants being enjoyed by others a century in the future. By spring, every acorn we planted that first autumn was gone without a trace. We'd inadvertently created a wildlife and livestock supplemental feeding program. We persisted and enlisted Stanford support. With tree shelters, weed suppression, livestock and rodent exclosures, and supplemental irrigation extending for several years, we've established over 2,000 oaks, roughly half of those we planted. These 200 are now closed canopy woodland and tower overhead. Hundreds are producing acorns and giving rise to seedlings and saplings, like these offspring of the trees in the prior slide. This is precisely what we had in mind when we began. In livestock exclusion areas, we have thousands of new naturally occurring young oaks, ranging from seedlings to shrubby adolescents shaped by deer. These three photos of the same hillside show how oak woodland has formed with 37 years of livestock exclusion. Similarly, in areas still grazed, Individually protected oaks have sprung to life after being released from grazing pressure. Despite these gains, we're wary of proclaiming victory. With global overconsumption and overpopulation, humans are creating a host of threats. We're destabilizing climate with more than three degrees Fahrenheit temperature increase since the 1890s. We're also causing biodiversity loss with 60% loss since 1970. We're causing more frequent and intense fires and we're contributing to ecosystems disruptions such as this plague of rodents. With global trade, we're introducing pathogens such as Phytophthora remorum, the cause of oak sudden death. If oaks we plant and care for are to survive to old age, billions of humans worldwide will change what we think and do. Before we dive more deeply into that larger issue, here are some hands-on recommendations. The first step is to plan, assess conditions, identify opportunities, budget, and select actions. We found 1928 aerial photos that showed where oaks had been and more recent ones that showed where they currently grow. 
These ovals mark some places where oaks were present in greater numbers than they are now. Gray also had a ton of great suggestions for how to learn about the historical ecosystems and land uses and how to use that information when choosing your plan for oak regeneration. With these aerials, topo maps, and on-the-ground inspection, we assess slopes and exposures and availability of water, like seasonal drainage that supports these trees and this artificially constructed vernal pool. We abstained soil surveys and sampled soils ourselves. We surveyed vegetation, native and introduced, and monitored fluctuations in rodent, deer, and insect predation. With this information and more, we formulated a plan and evolved it over time. As we've executed our plans, we've learned. When we were required to move the five young oaks in this photo that we unknowingly planted within an easement for the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct, we learned to check for underground utilities and for planned future land uses. Before we protect or plant, we budget. As a public service organization, we've operated with all volunteer labor, more than 20,000 people in total, and benefited from in-kind contributions of material. In addition, we su devote substantial resources to research and teaching. These are difficult to separate from those we devote to planting and protecting. With that disclaimer, I'll offer what I'm able. Our most cost-effective strategy has been protecting naturally established oaks from deer and livestock. With $30 in materials, an hour or so of initial labor, and an hour or so per year for a few years, a stunted shrub can become a beautiful young oak. The second is direct seeding of acorns. We've succeeded with everything from laying a few inches of wood chips or leaf litters with acorn in it, to fully protecting individual acorns with above and below ground hardware cloth, tree shelters, and where necessary, cattle exclosures. Third, if you have the ability to irrigate for two or more years, is planting nursery stocks. Cost to establish a 10 to 20 year old oak by direct seeding or transplanting can be one to several hundred dollars. Please keep in mind that everything depends. Genetics, soil, groundwater, pests, and more can affect growth and vigor as is evident in these two oaks planted in 2012, only a few feet apart. Since we found protecting existing oaks most cost effective, I'll begin there. We protect both by fencing areas and by enclosing individual trees. Trees that we've directly seeded into the landscape, those we've grown in our nursery and transplanted, those that we've individually protected after they've been repeatedly grazed, and those that took root naturally after cattle were excluded, have all required a decade or more to be able to withstand without protection the presence of cattle. Maintaining fences and being careful with gates are critically important. Even a brief entry by a single animal can result in death or severe damage to young oaks. To protect individual trees, we fabricated cages from 6 by 6 inch number 10 concrete reinforcing wire. Our cages are 6 feet tall and 2 to 3 feet in diameter. We mount them on three T-posts with about a foot of ground clearance so that cattle can eat competing vegetation within the footprint of the cage. In places where deer are active, we protect single leaders with tree shelters extended to seven feet. We guard more complex juvenile oak structure by wrapping around and sometimes above the cage with aviary netting. More than 80% of the individual volunteer trees we protect survive for at least 10 years. All but four of the trees on this hillside were repeatedly grazed shrubs, less than two feet tall in 1986 when we caged them. We've opened, removed, and reused cages repeatedly over a period of decades. We plant where oaks have grown and on sites we judge to be similar to nearby oak habitat. We plant on 15 to 25 foot centers and anticipate losses. While many who appreciate oaks unbendingly advocate planting only natives, we've come to question the wisdom of this. As we look ahead decades or more, we've rationaled to plant other species also. I'll make that case later. We've been limited primarily by capacity to irrigate. The land where we work has almost zero access to piped water. Vehicles are permitted only on its very few roads, so we mostly hand carry buckets from a tanker truck. When we plant acorns, we plant several per site and thin. When we grow seedlings, We've transitioned to growing them in air pruning containers to develop healthier root systems. To plant the seedlings from an 18 inch tall container, we dig a hole 10 to 12 inches in diameter and about 16 inches deep. 
When the soil is severely compacted and we're planting 20 or more sites, we may use a power auger to make it go more quickly. With, with surrounding soil, we build a six inch high water retaining berm. When we plant where ground squirrels, gophers, or voles are active, we place a four foot tall wire cylinder over the tree and root ball. Sometimes we wrap a cylinder in the nursery, others we install the cylinder at planting. We build cylinders either from aviary netting, which is sufficient to exclude most rodents, or quarter inch hardware cloth, which we found necessary against voles. As they grow, trees burst or incorporate these rodent exclusion cages. We then install a tree shelter that acts like a greenhouse and protects the tree from deer. We secure it with a seven foot rebar and we use wire skewers to keep the birds out of shelters as we've discovered that the nets supplied with them sometimes come off and it can also deform a tree's central leader if we take too long to remove them. We like to lay wood chip mulch to suppress competing vegetation and retain moisture. However, we've recently omitted it to deny cover to voles and because fire risk is increasing and it burns long and hot in a wildfire. Even though Stanford mows annually to establish fuel breaks, we sometimes lay reed mats of landscape cloth and or rock mulch to reduce fire hazard. We feed each tree with controlled release 2010-5 NPK fertilizer placed near the bottom of the planting hole. Here's a diagram and a photo of a recent planting protocol showing fertilizer placement, berm, screen, and tree shelter with our rebar stake and skewer. In the winter, we weed. During the dry season, we irrigate weekly the first year after planting and bi-weekly the second and sometimes subsequent years. In recent drought years, we've irrigated year round, pausing only during brief periods of rain. We also inspect and repair protection year round. We've lost a large number of trees in the past few years, including some that were more than 20 years old to girdling by voles. We've responded by exposing bare ground in a three foot radius circle around the trunk of each tree to deter the voles. We routinely extend shelters to about seven feet to prevent deer from browsing new growth. Once the central leader emerges from the shelter, we remove it, zip tie a bamboo stake to the rebar that had held the shelter and tie the tree to the bamboo. At the outset, I promise hands-on recommendations I also promise perspective on how global trends are increasingly limiting what we can accomplish locally. Between 1986 and 1992, oaks we planted struggled during what was then the most severe drought in half a century. That drought and other sense have been reason to think globally. We researched global climate change in California oaks and published our findings in the journal of the International Oak Society. In only a few decades, the climate in Monterey County may resemble that of Northern Baja, California. Oaks of any species are only found in a few small scattered locations there. With climate destabilization, oaks worldwide may be eliminated from much of their current range. Some species may even be driven to extinction. Beginnings of these shifts have already been documented. One projection for the future shows coast live oaks range in 2090, shrunk from the area outlined in blue to patches of red and green, some of which are in Monterey County. Another projection shows a 40% contraction of Blue Oaks range, which will also decrease substantially their range in Monterey County. Two others show Valley Oak persisting or even expanding their range in Monterey County. Though supported by copious research, all of these projections entail wide ranges of possible error. How might we hedge our bets to increase the chances that some of what we plant will be thriving 100 years from now? Between 2004 and 2013, in response to this question, we planted 300 diverse oaks at Stanford. In 2018, five to 15 years after planting, nearly three quarters have survived and some have flourished. Of particular interest are species and hybrids like these natives of Southern California, the Southwest, Texas, and Mexico that may be well adapted to future climates in Monterey County. Because oaks hybridize freely, sometimes incorporating just a handful of genes from one parent, local oak populations might adapt by borrowing from these and other introduced species. If local oaks disappear, introduced species and hybrids may be ecological analogs capable of fulfilling their previous, the roles of previously existing oaks in these ecosystems. The late Steve Jobs hired Dave Muffley, a former manager of planting for the second hundred years, 
specify and oversee installation of thousands of diverse oaks at Apple Park. Steve hedged his bets. He knew that heeding global trends is essential to success. Which brings me to my final promise, a framework and strategy for addressing both hands-on and global issues. To stop accelerating global ecological degradation that is already more rapid than any we've experienced in 400,000 years on this planet, and salvage what we can to provide a good future for ourselves and our descendants, will change what's in our hearts and minds. Let's use an ecological framework to take a look at why that's so. Like all living things, humans must maintain a match with our environment, the way a key matches a lock if we're to survive and thrive. We rely on our information, our genes and what we've learned to maintain that match. We can think of our information as what we carry in our hearts and minds. As we grow human population and wield more powerful technologies, the biosphere increasingly reflects our actions and our ideas about value, about what we want and how to get it on which we base our actions. We're depleting the resources on which we depend and creating hazards greater than any we've faced before. All of us want something different from this. All of us think we're acting to get something different from this. And of all of us are mistaken, at least in some ways, as is evident wherever we look. As we sit here contemplating oak regeneration, how can we get the results we want and avoid the rest? We've arrived at our strategy, use science to know value. When we think I want or I value, we predict that if we get what we want, we'll feel satisfaction. Many ideas about value, like our feelings about oak trees and what we'll do to sustain them, we acquire by chance life circumstances. In planting for the second hundred years, which now seems like a presumptuous name for a project, we've discovered that many ideas about value that were sufficient in the past appear ill-matched to the present and the future. There's nothing in the story of the man who planted trees about the worst drought in 1200 years, booming rodent populations, or increasingly severe fires. How can we adapt our ideas about value to meet the challenges of our era, base them on more accurate prediction? Humans have only one proven method to predict with accuracy better than we can achieve by chance. We call it science. Every human is a scientist. We all look for repeating patterns that we can use to predict successfully. That's how we learn to walk or to eat. That's why we put our left shoe on our left foot when we got dressed today. The many overlapping threats to oaks come from common roots, mistaken ideas about value. We can address a full spectrum of threats by using science to re-examine our ideas about value and by encouraging others to use science to re-examine theirs. As more of us practice science to shed illusions about value and see more clearly what we want and how to get it, we'll better preserve, protect, and enjoy value, including the oaks we love. When I began, I promised you three benefits. The first was hands-on recommendations that you can apply to plant and protect oaks on your land. The second was perspective on how global trends are increasingly limiting what we can accomplish locally. And the third was a framework and strategy my colleagues and I have found useful both for helping oaks survive on the lands we work and for addressing these larger issues. I hope you'll find these valuable in your work with oaks and in the rest of your lives. Thank you again and I appreciate your concern for oaks for the earth we share and your desire to protect oaks. If you have thoughts or questions, I'll welcome them during the discussion. And if you think that my colleagues or others at MAGIC may be of assistance to you as you think about how to help oaks thrive on your land, we'll welcome your inquiries. Great, thank you very much. Those were three amazing and informative presentations that I hope have provided a good basic understanding of oak tree restoration for our audience. Um, we have a couple of questions, so I'll get started with those. Um, and Hillary, since you just went up um, and presented, one of the questions was, uh, Debbie was really amazed with the 80% success rate for pre-existing and naturally occurring oaks for the last 10 years. And she just wants to confirm that um, you guys have, you mentioned that you guys have been having 80% success rate for um, natural occurring oaks. Yeah, for oaks that we protected that had been growing, we didn't plant them, but we protected them and watered them. Great, that's amazing. Okay. And then um, from Linda, we have a question. What about the part of natural succession, the coastal side 
of hybrid one, is that also a good management strategy? And I believe that was for Bruce. I don't quite understand. I, I, she's talking about okay. the, the ocean side. Go ahead, Gray. I think it's for me, actually. Oh, for you. So, Sorry, yeah, Gray. Sure. That's okay. I was showing that slide with the coastal side of Highway 1 uh, uh, changing to shrub and tree cover. And is that a good strategy was the question. And I, su I suppose it depends on our goals, right? Uh, the reason that's happening is because um, state parks uh, either doesn't have the funding to manage uh, disturbance in such a way to stop that or, or maybe and, or they have the philosophy that that's natural succession and that's what should happen. And, uh, and so there's winners and losers. Uh, the winners are uh, coyote bush, oaks, Douglas fir, and the species that go along with those. The losers are the many grassland dependent organisms that may live there otherwise. And, uh, and then those areas don't always have good biological surveys to actually, for us to understand what species are being lost and what are being gained. I hope that helps. Okay. And then uh, another question, how can you parse natural changes in the ecosystem type conversion and a system that hasn't undergone necessary disturbance such as the encroachment that occurs? Um, hmm. I'm not sure I can answer that question. How do I parse those things? <laughs> Um, maybe whoever asked that could take off mute and, and maybe help to understand the question. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I think you parse it by what Grace outlined, a process of understanding what was there in the past and understanding what your goals are now and doing the soil samples and other sampling you need to, to do to know what will work or what's needed to get to work what, what you want to work. But uh, I think we have pretty good aerial, aerial and remote sensing tools in California to understand the past and to know what cultural changes have occurred and then make the decision what vegetation you want to be at a given locale into the future. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's very difficult, I think, uh, for us humans in these, especially the coastal grasslands where you can create whatever you want, depending on the disturbance, like lots grows there, right? And so we have to think about what our goals are and what previous systems there were. Um, the, the rare plants and rare ecosystems drive what I'm after because those things are gonna disappear without our management. And I think in the desert, it'd be a lot easier because if you did the wrong thing, it probably wouldn't survive. Unless it was you know, some some invasive weed, which probably very few would really seek to spread, but here on the coast where you have better moisture, a lot of like Gray saying, a lot a lot will work. It's just depending on what should work or what you want to work. And before we continue, I just want to remind all of the audience members that as you um, begin to log off or if you have to go off to another meeting, um, please make sure to fill out the survey. That survey supports us in creating webinars like this that help meet your needs. And OK, we'll, we'll move on to um, a next. This is a comment from Debbie. And she comments that acorns can be toxic to cattle if they, are, if they eat too many. Um, perhaps is there a way that we can deal with those challenges? Yeah, I was wondering about that. I, I would, I'm ignorant about how much cattle eat acorns. Uh, I guess if, if there's low forage, and they're hungry, they're more at risk of uh, eating too many, too many toxins of irises or acorns or anything else that they normally wouldn't eat. So I think it's a cattle management issue more than trying to figure out a way to get them to stop eating acorns or what to do with the acorns toxicity or the acorns themselves. I, I doubt that they would eat a toxic product uh, enough to hurt themselves if they had a well-balanced diet otherwise. And I remember from previous conversations, um, I think I heard you guys mention that if, if there is other uh, 
material available for them to eat from, then they wouldn't prefer to, to eat um, the acorns. Yeah, cattle and other livestock are going to, you're like kids, you let them go into a, a grocery store and they're going to first go to the candy aisle and the last thing they're going to go to is, you know, the, the aisles that have things they don't like. And um, a question from Andrew, if you're watering these trees for the first few years, are there any issues when weaning off watering? Um, is anything done at a nursery level to grow trees that are hardier or more drought tolerant? I think that if you're, pl if you're planning to not water at all, you're better off sticking to planting acorns or um, protecting existing trees. But there are things you can do like selecting sites near seasonal drainages that I like to have more water, making sure that you plant during the wettest part of the year and stuff like that to try to give your trees the best chance with what water they can get. And, and I would add that when you go from irrigating to weaning the trees, it's usually at a time where the trees are very healthy, their root system has developed at depth, so it's starting to tap into natural moisture. And so you wean them as you can tell that they're able to handle being weaned. You wouldn't wanna walk away from a tree and stop checking it and let it die because it wasn't hardy enough without your continued irrigation. And sometimes you can't plant as much as you'd want during the wet season because there's other things you're doing, let's say habitat restoration projects or whatever you might be doing at that busy time of the year. So sometimes you have to plant when the worst time would be, when that would be like say the dead of summer or fall before rainfall has occurred. And then you just have to put into your plan, you know, irrigate and more expense because you're planting it at the wrong time of year, quote, quote. Also, when we plant nursery stock, we grow the uh, acorns in the, the nursery ourselves, and we grow the acorns into very tall tree pots. And that helps the tree establish a deep taproot uh, before it starts to grow up. And so then when we transplant it, it has a better ability to uh, get the water that it needs. And when we say we're going to water it the first three years of life, that's just an estimate because then if we have drought, we supplement it. Or like you said, if it looks like it needs more, we just keep on watering until we think it's established. And that's why I like Hillary's uh, mention of acorns being a, a top priority because the taller the pot, the deeper the root system, the deeper the hole you have to dig to plant the plant if you're far from a road, if you're on heavy clay soil, you don't want to get a heavy auger piece of equipment in, you know, there's, there's trade-offs to all this. And so, you know, the, the, the deeper root system has its advantages, but the disadvantage would be the ability to plant it in, in poor or dry hard soils or even wet heavy clay soils. Yes. Andrew, was that, did that answer your question? And um, also just an announcement that you guys, the audience members can also unmute themselves now in this part of, of the webinar. Now we're gonna hear what they really think. Yeah. Um, and this is a, another question from Debbie. Um, have you tested out protecting naturally occurring oak seedlings and samplings with shelters as opposed to planting acorns or seedlings, and if you did, have you seen any success with that? They go into some detail on that experimental contrast in that link that Pam provided to that 2005 article. And the conclusion I remember reading is that with cattle, both planted and protected, naturally recruited or volunteer oaks, uh, don't do as well without protection. But with cattle, if protected, um, they both do better. And I forget which one did better, just you know, one versus the other, but they both did better protected. Uh, 
and rather than compared to unprotected. But I think that article covered that question better than I could. And then um, we also have another question of curious to learn more about genetic issues associated with oak hybridization. Um, do you guys want to expand on that? Yeah, so oaks definitely hybridize very readily. And I think some people have concerns about whether bringing in oaks from other areas um, will cause hybridizing with natives and maybe impact the sort of purity of these native species. So, but so that's one concern I've heard. What we've done so far is focused on planting natives in more wild land areas like um, the Stanford dish, which is where most of our photos were taken in this presentation. And then we've done most of our experimentation with these other diverse species on central campus, which is much more developed area of campus. There's a lot of landscaping, a lot of lawns and shrubs and ornamental plants. And, um, but we do think that it's worthwhile to consider the possible benefits of these um, other oak species as well, given that it's clear that what has once existed here won't necessarily stay the same over the next several decades. And just to go along a little bit with what you were mentioning now, um, someone else asked, would introduced trees cause further likelihood of disease in native oak populations? So I think that is an important thing to think about. Like obviously almost everyone who works with oaks has heard of Phytophthora remorum. And that, although there are many different theories I think on where it came from, I think most people think the most likely is that it came on nursery stock imported from Southeast Asia. And so I definitely be careful moving plants around, be careful growing in nurseries. But if you collect acorns um, in the in the southern southeastern United States and grow them yourself in a nursery, I think there's a relatively low risk that you're going to be bringing pathogens with them. And the other question that I have, um, or that the audience had, was how do you identify favorable micro locations for planting? And maybe Gray can answer that. Well, um, I think we all talked about that in our presentations, right? So I talked yes. about where not to put them. Um, and then um, yeah, others, uh, Hillary might suggest you, you look at those historical aerials where oaks previously uh, existed. You remember that slide with pictures from 1928 where they used to be, and maybe that's a hint. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think uh, uh, Bruce is saying, hey, look where these old stumps are, another uh, hint about where they are, uh, where they could be. Um, uh, did Hillary also say that we might think about areas where there are seasonal drainages, where soils uh, might be wetter um, and so those are all considerations. And I think we'd all agree with, uh, with global warming and climate change. They probably particularly have to pay attention to slope and aspect. If you get in the intercoast range, you'll notice that oaks are mostly on the what east and north sides of the slopes just naturally. So you don't want to get outside of those. But if you follow those other guidelines you heard, I think um, you'll know about that. Um, so hopefully that, that covers it. Um, there's always experimentation, but isn't that hard when you start hearing about the costs of each oak tree to really establish it? So yeah, it sounds like you're investing quite a bit. So you want to be careful about where to start. Well, we're coming right up to the end of our webinar. So I encourage all the audience members that if you have any additional questions, feel free to email them to me and I can pass them on to the speakers. We'll be sharing the speaker slides with you um, following up the event. And again, I want to remind everyone to make sure to complete that survey. That's really informative for us. Um, but with that, I just really want to thank everyone. This has been a great teamwork that from all the speakers, the Big Star Land Trust and the California Marines Sanctuary Foundation. So thank you very much for joining. Adios. Adios.